All right, if you have a Bible or a Bible app, please go with me to the book of Matthew chapter 13. If you've been with us this summer, what you know that we've been going through the book of Matthew, and we'll continue doing this for the next few summers. And Matthew chapter 13 was kind of a long chapter. It talked a lot about different parables, and so we've spent about a month going through this chapter. And in this chapter, uh, Jesus has been rebuking bad religion. He's encouraging faith. Even the smallest amount of faith can have monumental difference in your life. And then he also taught us that God will do the sorting of people in the end. That the faithful, that the followers will join him forever in perfect paradise. And those who, who do not follow God, who pretend or play religion, will not be with God forever. And in verse 53, we read this. When Jesus had finished these parables, he moved on from there. Again, the last two chapters have been all about parables. We've probably heard about a dozen different Jesus parables. Some of them are like 20, 30 verses long. Some of them are only a verse long. But that time of teaching these potent truths is done, and Jesus is about to go and do something else. In fact, he's going to go to where he grew up. Verse 54, coming to his hometown, he began teaching the people in their synagogue, and they were amazed. Where did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers, they asked. I mean, can you imagine listening to Jesus? Can you imagine just hearing him in, in person, whether it was listening to the parables or whatever, and going, oh my goodness, there's something about the way he teaches that is truly transformative, that's life-changing. I mean, take it up a notch. Can you imagine walking with Jesus? Maybe you're walking through the park one day, and all of a sudden you see a blind beggar, and he's asking for coins, and Jesus, Jesus goes over and heals him. Could you imagine witnessing a real-life miracle? Or, or take it up one more notch. Can you imagine growing up with Jesus? Oh, you know, played soccer with him in middle school. You had a pizza party with him. You know, you remember doing the fun things with him. And then all of a sudden, you're seeing him do these miraculous things. Jesus shows up in his hometown. And now, again, this is referring not, not most likely to Bethlehem where he was born, but more likely Nazareth where he grew up. And the locals are fascinated because one of their own is showing up with power and authority and wisdom and to be honest, this wigs them out a little bit, right? I, I think I recognize here a normal phenomenon, which is spiritual authority is easier to digest from a distance. Let me explain what I mean. Years ago, many of you know that we lived in Africa, and... Uh, I remember being down there and, you, and ended up every few months I'd see these huge signs in front of different churches that would be talking about some person who's traveling through that you've got to come and listen to this guy. And they might have a tent revival because that was kind of their thing back then. And, or they'd just come back and listen, you know, this guy's coming, it's famous. And usually, I don't know if this is good, but usually they were Americans. And um, I had no clue who any of these guys were, but they would have these great titles like Apostle so-and-so or it would be Prophet so-and-so. And they would be coming through the towns and they would be giving their very unique, often, views of Christianity to the people. And I would often, especially the ones in my town, would go and look these people up on the internet. And I'd be like, huh, this is curious. This guy has a church of 56 people in East Texas, and he's coming to hear why. Well, it's kind of this principle being expressed here is he's looking for an audience. Because you know what's funny? It's interesting. When you have an accent... When you fly a different flag, when you just you come from a different area, it's sometimes more easy to be accepted when you're from the outside, right? And I, I, I look at you know, this whole thing in both positive and negative ways, but I see it all the time. It's easy to get traction when you're from somewhere else. Because when you're local, and people here know this, you're just local. You know, so what? And that's what they said here. Well, isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother's name Mary? And aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? And aren't all his sisters with us? I mean, they're indignant at this point. Hey, wait, that's Joe's son. 
We know his mom, Mary. Oh, wait, I know his brothers, right? Like, we know one of his brothers, James, because we went through his book at, at the beginning of the year. But the other brothers, we don't really know anything. I mean, this is the only mention. I mean, we see this twice in two of the gospel narratives that we see them listed like this. But, I mean, did you remember or know that Jesus has four brothers? And then who knows how many sisters he had? Was it two, three, five, seven? We don't know because... Sorry, ladies, women weren't important enough back then to actually mention all their names um, because they were now married to somebody, and that's all that matters is they're married to somebody. And that's what they were implying. Hey, didn't they become one with us? What they were referring to is most likely they all stayed there, and most likely they just married the guys of that region, right? But here's what's so fascinating. They knew Jesus, and that caused the problem. Look at the next verse. Where then did this man get all these things? And they took offense at him. Where in the world did the brother of James, Judas, uh, Joseph, and Simon get all this wisdom? And where did Jesus learn how to do miracles? I remember when we used to play soccer together. He wasn't doing miracles back then. Or even worse, I know a couple of Jesus' brothers. Do you know what they're like? Have you met his little sister? She's a gossip, right? How could anything good come from this family? And what was the response? They were offended. They were offended that Jesus came with all this wisdom and power. Doesn't that sound familiar? But we've seen that type of crazy responses in small towns. And I've noticed, by the way, that it does go both ways sometimes. Uh, I've been in small towns a whole life, really, and I've seen how big names can make either big splashes or bad splashes, depending on what people's perception are from them. So before we lived here, we lived up in the northwest corner of uh, the state of Washington, up in Whatcom County, and we lived outside of Bellingham in a town called Ferndale. And I remember when we were looking at buying a home in Ferndale, that we went to the high school there, Ferndale. It was so funny because what, high, what, what they promoted about themselves as a high school, oh, yeah, sure, we, you know, we have a good band or whatever. We have, but, but it was more than anything. It's, well, well, Jake Locker came from Ferndale. Now, some of you have no clue what that name is. It's American football player. He was a quarterback for the Tennessee Titans. He used to also play for UW, very famous guy. And so their, their claim to why we'd want to go to their schools, well, Jake Locker went here. Right, And I remember at the time, Jake Locker was a professional football player. We're kind of looking at this. And while we were there, Jake retired from football, and he came and actually ended up being one of the football coaches. So my son, would on a, he was a receiver, and so he would, he would receive on a daily basis passes from Jake Locker, and he just thought it was the best thing in the world because this was the son of Ferndale, right? <laughs> this was the guy, and they loved him so much. But then I've also seen the opposite where people from small towns, they leave the small town, they spread their wings, they go make it in the big city, and years later they come back, and they, well, aren't really all that well received. In fact, if you think about it, this is the premise of every single Christmas Hallmark movie. <laughs> you know I'm absolutely right about this, by the way. And the reason they aren't well received is because they come home bringing new thinking, different strategies, different wisdom that has been part of that space for a very long time. And in this text it says, because of his wisdom, insight, and miracles, people took offense. Why? Because they knew him as a little kid. He used to be one of them and they didn't like one of their own rising above them. Or could it be that he taught with such conviction, such strength, such truth, and such wisdom that what he was saying would require them to change. And oftentimes we don't like people who require us to change. By the way, if you're wondering, we now have biblical evidence, small towns haven't changed for 2,000 years, <laughs> right? All right, here it is. I was hoping our mayors were here today, are they? No, I don't see them, all right. I don't see you. Call you out at church if you're not here, mayors. That's it. <laughs> you know, like, I'm going to pray for Rosalind. No, I'm just uh. <laughs> Jesus took this all in stride because he understood. He understood this dynamic. But Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his own town and in his, I thought this was curious, in his own home. And he did not do many miracles there because of their lack of faith. 
There's a phrase that is actually attributed to Augustine in the fifth century that says, familiarity breeds contempt. Familiar with that phrase, right? We know that phrase. I, sure, Augustine, I'm sure he penned it, but his concept came from right here. This is where it started, right? Familiarity does indeed breed contempt. And Jesus' point is simple. When people know you well and grew up with you, when people have extensive knowledge of your family, it's hard for them to elevate you to the status of prophet or Messiah when you knew them as a kid. It's just hard to do that, right? Because they all knew him, they didn't believe him or support him or even have faith in him. And so in that environment, Jesus chose to do less of the miraculous. I find that reaction fascinating. And it made me think, as I was listening to this, how many of us need to hear this spiritual reality? Here's what I mean. Suppose you have great faith in God. Suppose you've been journeying with God for decades, and you know who God is, you believe in God, you're faithful to God, your desire is to put God as first and best in your life. But, and this is a very big but, but parts of your family or even longtime friends want nothing to hear from you about faith. They don't care about your religion, they don't want to know your Jesus, they don't really understand your faith, and, and they don't want you talking about it to them. And on top of that, you're not Jesus. Jesus was perfect and still had people question him and doubt him and not want to have faith with him. And by the way, if you haven't noticed, I'm pretty sure you have, but if you haven't noticed, you're not perfect. You're not. And, and, I, and I, I think a lot of people struggle to hear this, but it's so true. We are broken. We're broken. We've modeled our brokenness, our weakness, our selfishness, and our sin for years. And people close to you know that you're broken. And you know what? They don't want you to tell them about Jesus because why? Because who would listen to you? Because you've screwed up. And I've observed this truth. They won't listen to you until you own your brokenness. You have to own that. And even then, because of your sinfulness, because of your patterns, even if they're long gone, because of your arrogance, meanness, inappropriateness, stupidity, or whatever, you may have lost the privilege of ever telling them about your Savior. So what do you do? See, I think there's a tension as a result of this. It's very clear in the scriptures. God actually tells us again and again and again, I'm not going to proof text this for you because I think we all know this, that it is our responsibility as the followers of Jesus to promote Jesus to others because he is the gift to the world, and why would we not give that gift away? So how do you do that when we've lost faith with those around us? How do we do that when those close to us look at us with doubt or even disgust? I want to give you three ways, because I think this matters, that we continue sharing despite our histories. Sometimes the greatest thing that you can do is pray. You know maybe you've lost the chance. You know maybe because of your past behavior or because of however you interacted, you know it's going to be really hard to get through that wall that they've built up. And you've per permanently prevented yourself from ever being able to share with that person. Own that. Own that truth. And ask God that he would send others into your family system, into your friendship group, or into your neighborhood to make a difference that you know you simply can't make. Ask the Savior for help, and remember, you're not the Savior. Prayer is so powerful. It changes everything, and we believe in that here. Second is establish a new track record before sharing. I have watched this happen again and again and again with people who have abruptly come to faith in Jesus. They have been living their life, doing whatever they want. They find Jesus and God transforms them and it's beautiful and it's awesome. But do not demand that the people around you have to find faith in your time frame. That's between them and God. And what we need to have in those spaces is tons of grace. Our job is to love consistently. And here's the problem. There are plenty of people in this room who are addicts, and I'm going to use this word loosely, in ways that we don't even admit. There are hoarding addicts. 
There are greed addicts, there are job addicts, there are busy addicts, performance addicts, money addicts, and there's alcoholics, should I keep going? There are entertainment addicts, control addicts, recreation addicts, gaming addicts. There are so many ways that we can become sidetracked from the real work. And when we model that to other people, they'll look at us and say, I don't want what you're addicted to. I don't want what you're like. I want, and they don't understand that there's a Jesus behind that that's changing all of it. And if they can somehow see him, that's what they really want. They want the Jesus that can change us. And I think this leads us to point three, which is, Model loving God and loving others. If you know it may be hard for others to accept where you are, whether that's in your home or your extended family or your neighborhood, choose love. Don't choose anger. Please, for the love of God, don't choose judgment. Don't choose gossip. Don't choose control. Don't choose those things that are actually going to drive those other people away. Choose love. And even then, remember... Jesus, who was perfect, struggled with sharing faith in his own home and his own hometown because those closest to him had the hardest time believing him because familiarity breeds contempt. Church, let's not be afraid to share Christ with everyone. But when we do it, let's use wisdom from above so when we do it, it is in the best way possible. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, listen, I wanted to end this funky service in a little bit different way anyway because I heard let you talk way too much and get all that administration done, which in some ways it feels like a little bit of sin to try to do that much administration. But... Um, Uh, I'm just not wired for that. But what I wanted to leave you with was something special. You might remember when we started this series at the beginning of uh, the summer, we watched a video talking about the first 13 chapters of next week. We start into verse or chapter 14. So I wanted to give you the second half of the book. And this is from the Bible Project. And this is the last half of the book of Matthew. This is going to whet your appetite for what's coming for the weeks for the rest of the summer. So check this out. Matthew introduced Jesus as the Messiah from yes. the line of David. Thanks, guys. And as a new authoritative teacher like Moses, and also as Emmanuel, which in Hebrew means God with us. After Jesus announced and taught about the arrival of God's kingdom, and after he brought the kingdom into day to day life among the people of Israel, we saw that Jesus was accepted by many, but rejected by others, especially Israel's religious leaders, the Pharisees. And so the big question is, how is this conflict between Jesus and Israel's leaders going to play itself out? The next large section, chapters 14 through 20, explore all the different expectations people have about the Messiah. So Jesus keeps healing sick people, and twice he even miraculously provides food for these huge crowds in the desert. One is made up of Jewish people, and the other is a non-Jewish crowd. And this sign, it's very similar to what Moses did for Israel in the wilderness. And so all these people are excited about Jesus. They think he's the great prophet and the Messiah, but not the religious leaders. Their view of the Messiah is built on passages like Psalm 2 or Daniel chapter 2 about a victorious Messiah who's going to deliver Israel and defeat the pagan oppressors. And from their point of view, Jesus, he's a false teacher. He's making blasphemous claims about himself. And so there are stories here about them increasing their opposition, hatching a plan to kill him. And so in response, Jesus, he withdraws. And he begins teaching his closest disciples what it means for him to be Israel's Messiah because it is not what anybody expects. So Jesus asks his disciples, chapter 16, he says, who do you all say that I am? And Peter comes up with the right answer, it seems. He says, well, you're the Messiah. You're the son of the living God. But then it becomes clear that Peter's thinking about a king who's going to reign victoriously through military power. And Jesus challenges Peter, saying that, yes, I am going to become king, but through a different way. And so Jesus starts to teach on themes from the prophet Isaiah, who said that the messianic king would suffer and die for the sins of his own people. And so Jesus, he was positioning himself as a messianic king who reigns by becoming a servant and who would lay down his life for Israel and the nations. Well, Peter and the disciples, they mostly just don't get it. And so Jesus enters into the fourth block of teaching, followed by a series of teachings after that. 
And these are all about the upside-down nature of Jesus' messianic kingdom, which turns upside down all of our value systems. So in the community of the servant king, you gain honor by serving others. And instead of getting revenge, you forgive and do good to your enemies. And in Jesus' kingdom, you gain true wealth by giving your wealth away to the poor. To follow the servant Messiah, you must become a servant yourself. In the next section, we watch the two kingdoms clash, Jesus' kingdom and that of Israel's leader. Jesus comes to Jerusalem for Passover riding in on a donkey, and the crowds are hailing him as the Messiah. And Jesus immediately marches into the courtyard of the temple, and he creates this huge disruption that brings the daily sacrifices to a halt. His actions speak louder than words here. As Israel's king, Jesus was asserting his royal authority over the temple, the place where God and Israel met together. And in Jesus' view, the temple was compromised by the hypocrisy of Israel's leaders. And so here he's challenging their authority, and naturally, they're deeply offended. And so they try to trap Jesus and shame him in public debate, and they fail. So they end up just determining to have him killed. In response, Jesus delivers his final block of teaching. He first offers this passionate critique of the Pharisees and their hypocrisy, and then he weeps over Jerusalem and its rejection of God and his kingdom. Then Jesus withdraws with the disciples, and he starts telling them what's going to happen. He's going to be executed by these leaders, but in doing so, they're going to create their own demise, because instead of accepting Jesus' way of the peaceful kingdom, they're going to take the road of revolt against Rome, and so Jerusalem and its temple are going to be destroyed. But, Jesus says, that is not the end of the story. He's going to be vindicated after his death by his resurrection. And one day, he'll return and set up his kingdom over all nations. And so in the meanwhile, the disciples need to stay alert and stay committed to just announcing Jesus and his kingdom and spreading the good news. And so with all of that ringing in the disciples' ears, the story comes to its climax. That night, Jesus takes the disciples aside and he celebrates a Passover meal with them. The Passover retells the story of Israel's rescue from slavery through the death of the Passover lamb. And then Jesus takes the bread and the wine from this meal as new symbols, showing that his coming death would be a sacrifice that would redeem his people from slavery to sin and evil. After the meal, Jesus is arrested. He's put on trial before the Sanhedrin, a council of Jewish leaders. And they reject his claim to be the Messiah. They charge him with blasphemy against God. Then Jesus is brought before the Roman governor, Pilate, and he thinks Jesus is innocent, but he gives in to the pressure from the Jewish leaders, and he sentences Jesus to death by crucifixion. So Jesus is led away by Roman soldiers and crucified. Now, you'll notice right here in this section that just like Matthew did in the opening chapters, he increases the number of references to the Old Testament. He's trying to show that Jesus' death was not a tragedy or a failure. Rather, it was the surprising fulfillment of all of the old prophetic promises. Jesus came as the servant Messiah, spoken of by Isaiah. He was rejected by his own people, but instead of judging them, he is judged on their behalf, bearing the consequences of their sin. So the crucifixion scene, it comes to a close, and Jesus' body is placed in a tomb. But the book ends with a surprising twist, the last chapter. The disciples, they discover on Sunday morning that Jesus' tomb is empty. And then all of a sudden people start seeing Jesus alive from the dead. And the book concludes with the risen Jesus giving a final teaching called the Great Commission. Jesus says that he is now the true king of the world. And so he sends his disciples out to all nations with the good news that Jesus is Lord and that anyone can join his kingdom by being baptized and by following his teachings. And echoing all the way back to his name, Emmanuel, God with us from chapter one, Jesus' last words in the book to his disciples are, I will be with you. It's a promise of Jesus' presence until the day he finally returns. And that's the gospel according to Matthew. Isn't that great? Listen, church, will you stand with me right now? Uh, we're going to close our service with one final song. And as the musicians are coming, let me just pray that the wisdom that we even just saw in this video would be our marching orders as a church. Lord, would you give us wisdom to know 
when the people around us don't want to hear from us? Will you give us the guidance to, to be able to support them however we might be able to support them with grace and truth? And Lord, would you enable in us that deep desire to go, literally it says in the scriptures, to the nations to help those who don't yet know you? And would you inspire this congregation to be those people that we would go to our neighbors, that we'd go to our community, that we would go to our, our country, that we would go to the nations of the world with your love, both now and forevermore. Thanks for this wisdom, Lord, and may Matthew continue to enthrall us. We ask in your name, amen.